More than 100 civilians are evacuated from the besieged city of Mariupol while the battles continue in Ukraine. What is it going to take to bring this conflict to an end? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. After weeks of ceasefire negotiations, a safe corridor was organized to evacuate civilians from a steel plant in Mariupol. More than 100 left in buses, but despite the deal, according to the Ukrainian foreign minister, Russia continues to shell the plant. So far, I can commend uh, tireless efforts of the United Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross for making it happen. But everything is very fragile. Things can fall apart at any given moment. So it's better to wait until vacation is over. OK, to discuss the Ukrainian conflict, let's bring in our panel. From Lviv, Pavlo Kukta is the former Ukrainian acting minister of economy. Here in Washington, D.C., Anton Fadyashin is a professor of history at American University. Also in D.C., Yuval Weber is research assistant professor at Texas A&M University. And Joseph Gregory Mahoney is professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University. He joins us from Shanghai in China. Welcome to all of you. And Pavlo, let me start with you. Let's look at the status of the conflict in Ukraine right now. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the recent developments is the evacuation of civilians from Mariupol. More than 100 have left that besieged uh, steel plant there. Um, what can you tell us about what you know in Mariupol right now, the number of civilians that remain, and what the security situation is there like? Well, as you know, Mariupol was besieged uh, since the very first days of the war uh, and essentially reduced to rubble by the besieging Russian forces. And the last defenders of Mariupol are now uh, protecting themselves in the steelworks of a very, very large metallurgical plant called Azovstal, uh, under which, since Soviet times, there is a system of catacombs designed actually to protect from nuclear strikes. So this is essentially what the defenders are holding, and there are quite a lot of civilians. They're hard to say exact numbers. I think they number in the hundreds. So about 100 were released today. As for how many citizens are left in whatever rubble is left of the city itself, again, hard for anyone to estimate, probably in thousands. But uh, this is of a city that used to house hundreds of thousands of uh, citizens. Uh, so Mariupol has been totally devastated in the course of the Russian invasion. What about uh, Ukrainian troops? Are there Ukrainian troops there as well? Yes, Azov style remains under the control of Ukrainian forces. Uh, the Azov uh, regiment and the, I believe, 36 uh, Marine Infantry Brigade. Uh, they are indeed defending the plant. Uh, they are still besieged there. Uh, I know there is a big problem because the Russians are in violation of Geneva Convention, refusing to allow the evacuation of the wounded. Uh, servicemen. Right. So they've let some civilians through, but they're not allowing to evacuate uh, wounded soldiers, despite the fact that Geneva Convention explicitly prescribes that this has to be allowed. Okay. One other development, uh, Pablo, and that is the United Kingdom, Denmark, France, and the United States have announced that they will be moving their embassies back to the capital, Kyiv. Does that tell us that they believe, and Ukraine believes, that the capital is now sufficiently secure, relatively safe? Well, I can tell you that the UK has already moved its embassy back to Kyiv. Some other embassies, including actually the post-Soviet countries who have perhaps some more understanding of what's happening in Russia because they retain better connections, they are also returning. So yes, it seems like the international community in general is assessing the situation in Kyiv as uh, relatively safe. Again, we're talking in relative terms because the most recent missile strike on the town was like a couple of days ago. So uh, the Russians are continuing to shell Ukrainian towns with missiles, uh, but it seems like uh, the danger of a ground invasion has passed because they essentially they are bogged down in the east and the south of the country. So the large-scale invasion that they've kind of fantasized about in the beginning has failed. They've been defeated at that.
Yuval Weber, uh, looking at these NATO members that have moved their embassies back to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, is this also a message to Russia to say, look, you don't pose a threat anymore. Uh, you may be in the east of the country, but no longer in any other part of the country. Oh, so certainly. I mean, it suggests uh, as openly as possible that the, you know, from the Western perspective, the tide of the conflict is turning. Uh, and this also suggests that whatever Russia has been able to do, it's no longer able to do, and that both Ukrainian forces and Western support for Ukraine is only going to increase. And the, you know, the quote-unquote normality from the Western perspective, where Ukraine has its sovereignty, exercises control over its own territory, is more a matter of time rather than a matter of if it actually happens. You say the tide of the conflict is turning. Uh, the United States uh, Democrat politician, uh, who is also Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Nancy Pelosi, she's just visited Ukraine. Uh, this is some of what she had to say. Let's listen. Our discussion centered around the subjects at hand, as you would suspect. Security, humanitarian assistance, economic assistance, and eventually rebuilding when victory is won. Uh, so, Yuval, though we have the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, talking about when victory is won, we've also had heard similar sentiments from the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, as well as the United States Defense Secretary, uh, Lloyd Austin. Um, so they, but they believe, and the Ukrainians believe as well, that this is going to be decided militarily, that Ukraine is going to prevail on the battlefield. That's how this conflict will end. That's how it will be settled. Do you believe that to be the case? So, so sure thing. So in terms of, uh, I think it was mentioned in the, the preamble to the show, is that President Biden has asked for an additional $33 billion of assistance to Ukraine, of which $16 billion is military aid. From the last uh, assistance package to Ukraine, uh, the United States has already sent uh, roughly $3.7 billion of military aid, which is that there's another $2.8 billion or so left. So that is the money that is being basically put into Ukraine right now in order to provide it the ability to not lose. Mm -hmm. And so what this additional package uh, is meant to do, and if, if you mind, the quote by uh, Secretary of Defense Austin the other day was, quote, we want to see Russia weaken to the degree that it can't do the things, the kinds of things that it, it has done in invading Ukraine. Mm -hmm. They can win if they have the right equipment and the right support. And so to that extent, we can see that, in essence, Western war aims is to allow Ukraine to have the ability to control its own land and that the United States and its allies are going to be able to provide both the military assistance as well as the financial humanitarian assistance in order to, one, expel Russia from Ukraine, mm -hmm. and two, stabilize the economic and humanitarian situation across the rest of the country and ostensibly across the rest of the region. As much of that aid will go to uh, refugees in places like Poland, Germany, etc., cetera, um, so that they can basically repatriate themselves back to uh, Ukraine. Okay, so Yuval, just to clarify the situation, your answer to my question is yes, this will be sorted out, resolved militarily. So sure, so the amount of military uh, aid that is going to Ukraine. So Russia just has its latest uh, conscript class. So they'll have another 135,000 soldiers that'll be ready in roughly six to nine months. The, that's really the, mm -hmm. you know, late fall, early winter at the earliest. Mm -hmm. And so what the military aid from the West is meant to do is to have Ukraine, to the degree possible, win before that time, mm -hmm. or win to an extent, or, or get to be winning up to, uh, to the extent that when it goes back to the negotiating table, it does so from a position of equality or strength. Why and would it have to negotiate if it wins? Excuse me? Why would Ukraine have to negotiate if it wins? So when, when it wins, that's just a, a point in time. The security problems between Russia and Ukraine are, are, are pretty complex, and to the ex and obviously, as long as Vladimir Putin is in power, Russia will pose a threat to Ukraine. And so, what Ukraine obviously wants to do is to win to an extent that it can get additional uh, external security guarantees, so that it can not only take its territory back but hold on to it, rather than fighting a series of wars indefinitely over years or decades. Anton Fedyashin, what is your view on that? Uh, you know, we just, we've been hearing that Ukraine is going to be able to win this on the battlefield and then would negotiate with Russia. I'm not sure what it would negotiate with Russia, because if it wins, it will be able to impose its will on Russia. 
Um, I'm, not, I'm not as uh, <clears throat> optimistic as uh, Yuval is about this. Um, I don't think that there'll be a clean Russian victory, but I don't see the Ukrainians uh, really expelling the Russians from their territory, especially considering how much territory the Russians have taken. Pavlo was absolutely right in the beginning. Yes, the, uh, uh, the occupation of all of eastern Ukraine, the decapitation of the government, if that was the initial plan, certainly uh, failed, and the Ukrainians certainly demonstrated that they are willing to fight and they're highly motivated to defend their country, its sovereignty and its independence. But when you glance at the map of the amount of territory that the Russians are holding right now, and they're slowly creeping further and further into the Donbass, not the other way around, I have a horrible suspicion that what we're going to end up with is the Russians reaching the administrative borders of the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, um, regions and then halting, and then we're going to be facing a uh, frozen conflict with, with sporadic, uh, punctuated um, uh, bursts of attempts to put the, uh, push the Russians back and uh, vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, I don't see any, any of the sides, anyone pulling the sword out of the proverbial uh, stone. I think we're moving towards a much more complex uh, situation that will have to be negotiated at the, um, uh, at the diplomatic table, but mm -hmm. from a position of a, uh, of a stalled uh, military campaign. Right. And Anton, if you say the conflict is going to be frozen, um, I guess that means that Russia is going to be prepared for, a long, for the long haul, for a very long conflict which could last months, if not years. Uh, quite possibly. Um, I didn't think so, I'll be honest with you, two months ago when uh, we spoke. But it's beginning to look like the Russians are preparing for the uh, long haul, as are the Europeans uh, with their move away from Russian energy sources. Um, these are the kinds of decisions that have to be made with a very long horizon. Uh, in mind, and it's certainly looking like Europe is moving in that direction. But this is going to take time. Joseph Gregory Mahoney, how does China look at this conflict? Uh, the United States called upon China uh, to support uh, its criticism of Russia, to support its sanctions of Russia. In fact, President Biden warned the Chinese of unspecified consequences if they didn't do what the Americans told them to do. Well, you know, first of all, China has been very clear from the beginning that it's neutral and that it opposes sanctions. Um, and as we saw in the, in the uh, foreign ministry press conference uh, uh, several days ago, um, uh, being said very explicitly, and, and, and I think more explicitly than, than has been said in recent times, it, it understands well that the U.S. is often an instigator. Uh, it's a mess maker. It's one that constantly meddles and exploits uh, the internal affairs of others, both directly and indirectly. Uh, and in this respect, uh, China, uh, as we must say, m like most of Asia and the developing world, is sympathetic with both Ukraine and Russia, uh, dislikes the conflict, uh, wishes it would reach a peaceful end. Uh, they're all being uh, negatively impacted by it, by push, uh, inflation, cost push inflation. Um, but I think we, the, the, the bigger issue that, that, that we have to look at here is uh, the, the criticism that China has uh, a friendship treaty with Russia. And I think in this context, we need to recall that, you know, before the conflict in Ukraine, Biden was discussing turning NATO against China. And while those efforts stalled, he initiated a new military alliance, AUKUS, which proliferated nuclear weapons to Australia against China. He's pressed uh, relentlessly forward with the so-called Quad Alliance, trying to create another alliance against China. He's acknowledged U.S. troops in Taiwan. He's maintained the trade war. He's demonized uh, China in, in global discourse. So China is loath to join an American-led effort uh, one that, from its perspective, is part of a larger strategy aimed against Beijing. And secondly, we have to recall that China and, the, and uh, Russia have not always had warm relations. In fact, from the late 1960s to more recent uh, times, China-U.S. relations were better. Uh, however, starting with the U.S. wars in the Persian Gulf, which had the strategic value of allowing, of allowing the U.S. to manipulate the global oil supply, and followed by the U.S. invasion and base building in Central Asia after 9-11, China was compelled to strengthen its relationship with Russia to ensure regional security and access to energy. So, you know, all of these things combined with the fact that China shares a long uh, border with Russia, uh, shares the, the, the perspective that this is a long conflict that can't afford to quit 
uh, access to Russian oil. Uh, these are what's compelling it to stick to its current position, and I don't think it will be shaken from it. Yuval Weber, what do you make of uh, the fact that China has taken a neutral position on this? Well, certainly, I think we'd be in a different world if uh, if the war ended in two days or two weeks, and with you know ostensibly Russia being a clear winner. Mm -hmm. And you know, Anton put out a, a scenario in which there would be something like a frozen conflict or maybe some World War One style uh, stalemate type um, result. Mm -hmm. But the amount of military aid going, you know, into Ukraine is, is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. And whatever Russia's ability to withstand basically the economic damage, particularly as an oil embargo seems to be coming up in the next couple of weeks mm -hmm. and a natural gas embargo per, per, perhaps by the end of the year, mm -hmm. is that Russia is going to be under a lot of pressure to win. And part of that is uh, what uh, Dr. Mahoney was describing a moment ago, which is Russia needs to be able to play an active role in international affairs, not just for itself, but in order to work with the United, uh, with China rather, um, to withstand the pressures of the U.S. foreign policy agenda, as Dr. Mahoney said a moment ago, there's a number of things that the United States has done to make China less secure in its own region, and China needs Russia to do well. Um, and so, in that regard, China is adopting a neutral uh, uh, perspective. But it really would prefer, in a, in a larger sense, I think, for Russia to win so that its larger arguments about reordering um, international affairs, reducing the power of the United States, things that are generally common to both Russia and China, could in fact happen. And so that's how I think we would have seen more Chinese mm. overt support for Russia had Russia been more successful in the first weeks of its war. Pablo, uh, we have heard several calls for there to be a negotiated settlement to this conflict. The latest call came from the United Nations Secretary General just a few days ago. We even had the Ukrainian Foreign Minister, who's been emphasizing the need for a political solution. But as we've just heard, NATO continues to supply weapons to Ukraine, which, of course, ensures that the war continues. Uh, one other development, I mean, we are seeing even in some establishment uh, American publications here that many journalists are now calling this a proxy war. They're calling it a war between Russia and the United States, which is being fought in Ukraine. And of course, Ukraine is paying the price and paying very dearly for this proxy war. So wouldn't it be in Ukraine's interest right now to push very hard for uh, a diplomatic solution? Well, first of all, I would disagree with your assessment that weapon supplies actually prolong the conflict. I think they are actually what allows to end it. Remember, this is a war of Russian aggression, right? It's fought on Ukrainian soil. Ukraine never instigated it. Mm -hmm. And the only way to end it somehow is to expel the Russians or have them go away. Yes, I believe also that this will end in, on the negotiations table simply for the fact that I don't believe Ukrainian military will march all the way to Moscow to try to capture it and impose some kind of unconditional surrender on, the, on Russia. Right? This is not in the works right now. What is in the works is it's throwing the Russian military. Yeah, I think, out Pablo, we're Ukraine. talking here about a narrow definition of victory. We're talking here about expelling the Russians from Ukraine, not. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Not and of course, for this to happen, uh, beyond that, it's also negotiations, right? But negotiations from a different standpoint, where essentially we can return to the status quo we had before the war in terms of. For territorial control, uh, re-establish some kind of normal relationship and try to uh, live normally for the run, to the extent that this can happen after what the Russians did in Ukraine, after Bucha, after Mariupol, after the crimes, after what has happened. But at the very least, we're talking about restoring some kind of normalcy. And yes, battlefield is a solution to that, but after that come the negotiations. And weapon supplies do indeed help to bring this about faster. Without this, the war would get prolonged, right? It would cost many more lives. It will take longer. Perhaps Russians would advance somewhere, get, get uh, guerrilla resistance from Ukrainians. There'd be a lot more blood. There'd be a lot more human suffering. The faster this war ends, the better. I mean, the ideal way is, of course, for Russians to, right now, cease fire and stop this madness. But they're not doing it, right? Unfortunately, one of the sides is clearly acting in a very rational fashion. If you look at the results they have got, which is essentially 
a military defeat compared to what they expected and what they tried to sell themselves to the world as. And uh, huge sanctions, the largest in history, and uh, international isolation and condemnation. It's a very, very strange result. I mean, it clearly was a huge miscalculation. They're continuing to do it. The longer they prolong the war, the longer they're essentially miscalculating. But since they're doing that, then the only way is to beat them back. Anton, what are your thoughts on uh, how this ends? Uh, you know, the point I was making there was by NATO supplying more weapons to Ukraine. It uh, extends the conflict, but uh, as Pablo just told us, no, it doesn't. It actually speeds it brings it to an end in a much quicker way. I think that uh, uh, of an eventual suspension of the active part of the war is uh, going to happen, and I think the Russians are going to um, bring this about when, again, they reach the administrative borders of the Luhansk and uh, uh, Donetsk provinces. But from there on, um, it, this may turn into a very long-term uh, negotiation um, uh, routine. Uh, and while that's going on, um, if the sanctions are left in place on Russia, which uh, they most likely will, um, we're going to be facing, the whole world is going to be facing a slow process of economic uh, attrition where um, uh, no one's investing in Ukraine or reconstructing it actively until there is a uh, peace. The Russians are pushing for conditions that are favorable to them, which, of course, the Ukrainians will be doing also. The Russian economy will be under sanctions. But as a direct result of those sanctions, uh, there's going to be a very long-term increase in energy prices, which, as we all know, spills over into literally everything that we consume, that we use, that we buy, that we sell. Um, and we're facing, the whole world is facing a uh, global recession, something that the World Bank and the IMF have already uh, spoken about on multiple uh, occasions. Uh, meanwhile, the Europeans are going to try to wean themselves off from uh, Russian oil and gas, but that's yeah. going to be a very long-term and very slow uh, process. Um, so this war in general, to speaking uh, sort of more broadly, more historically, is yeah. acting like a catalyst for um, for trends that have begun before but are now being sped up. And that the, the most important of that, from my perspective, is the gradual de-Westernization of uh, the global economy and the de-dollarization of it. And the results of that, by the way, I'm not sure are necessarily positive at all. Yuval Weber, what are your thoughts on whether this is a uh, proxy war? Um, and at worst, is this some attempt by the United States at regime change? Uh, to call this a proxy war is to deny the, the statehood and the agency and the sovereignty of the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. As we've heard from Pablo over the course of uh, the episode, uh, they're pretty interested in fighting for their homes, their houses, their language, their, their nation, their autonomy. So I don't think it's a proxy war. I think clearly, like, the United States and the larger, uh, you know, coalition is definitely in favor of Ukraine winning. Mm -hmm. um, if that results in domestic political turbulence in Russia, that's on Russia to resolve. So it's not really up to, I think, the West to pick and choose the, the leaders of Russia. It's for Russians to do so. And so I'm not sure what would be the connection of if the people of Russia or the elites of Russia don't think that Vladimir Putin is the man to lead them boldly into the rest of the 21st century, then that's up to them. Uh, Joseph Gregory Mahoney, um, looking at when this conflict ends, and it will end at some point, how do you think that would leave the relationship between China and Russia? Well, let me just add that I, I do think, you know, absolutely it's a proxy war. Um, and I, I think that uh, when we, when we combine this with um, the, the two developments we got recently from Berlin, first, the, the German foreign minister saying that, um, that sanctions against Russia will not be lifted until Russia withdraws from the Donbass and Crimea, right? In other words, it's, it's something that isn't just about stopping the conflict and, and withdrawing to more or less the borders that uh, de facto existed before the conflict started. It's going back uh, to, to, you know, post-Soviet borders. Uh, and that's very unlikely in, in any time in the near term. Uh, I think I think the thing that that is really uh, concerning 
is that um, if we look at a lot of international media, and I mean sober international media in the U.S., um, uh, in the Financial Times, uh, in some leading uh, Australian publications, that the crisis in Ukraine is actually distracting people from the still rapidly declining relations between China and the U.S. And, you know, people are saying, uh, you're being distracted by this, but uh, the, the danger of war between the U.S. and China is a mounting threat, and it's one that needs to, to see some sort of action now uh, to prevent. And so I think that the, the longer that, that this conflict lasts in Ukraine, and depending on how it uh, uh, results, uh, will have an impact on whether or not uh, China and the U.S. can reset relations. Um, I'm, I'm not optimistic about that presently. I think we have a dark future ahead of us. Joseph, when you say it is distracting from the, the problems in the relationship between the United States and China, uh, tell us a bit more about that. How is it distracting us? Well, you know, I think if, if we go back and, and we look at before uh, the, the conflict started, what we were primarily focused on in, in global media was the fact that the U.S. had proliferated uh, uh, nuclear weapons to Australia, the fact that the U.S. was trying to build uh, uh, relations under the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, concept uh, to create a new alliance, um, uh, including India and um, um, uh, Japan um, and um, uh, Australia against uh, China. Uh, you know, we just had a recent uh, election in South Korea. Um, the conservative won by, I think, a, a percentage point, and he's going to accelerate the advancement, uh, the, the, the um, uh, upgrading of the, the missiles in um, uh, South Korea that, that had so irritated China in the past uh, mm -hmm. that would put them under direct control of the U.S. Uh, uh, missile command. And so we see all of these things pressing forward at breakneck speed, mm -hmm. and yet we're, we're, we're completely distracted by what's happening in um, uh, Ukraine and the fact that China is, in, is somehow being blamed uh, for all of this, uh, while the U.S. is you know, steadily positioning for uh, a possible conflict with China down the road. OK, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And that is it for this edition of The Heat. But the conversation continues online. Join us on CGT in America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show or chat with us on Twitter at CGT in America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.